Victor Tokoza. Makos. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for the for the invitation and the opportunity. And um, I just greet everyone um, wherever you are. Sia Bingelela, Sia Kulega, Makos. One intervention, please. Uh, the time is limited to 15 minutes only. Uh, David, you have to keep track of the same. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of it. So we, 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 we have a time period. We'll cover everything. Thank you. All right, you can go ahead, Doc. I'm I'm smiling at the at the starting by giving me time because now it's it's uh, it puts a bit of anyway but it's a bit of pressure. So uh, as uh, Prof um, David has said, I am a, a traditional healer, a Makosi in the South African uh, Isizulu culture, and I must um, commend Prof uh, Imeje because I think he has laid the foundation quite well. Uh, just to go into the detail and the depth of our African traditional medicines and African traditional healing. I do think that um, some of the points that he raised uh, for me uh, touch me in my space, especially his, um, his, his call that, um, we, that there needs to be a, a move towards continuous training rather than the neglect of African traditional healers and traditional medicine, which has been the case. And I think that we all do need to take a step back because if we are not going to be looking at how we support the actual practitioners like myself and the practice and the documentation and also the validation of our practices, the end goal of being able to get pharmaceutical grade products or industrial exploitation, as the prof said, becomes all that much more difficult because the foundations is the philosophies or the systems or the structures which um, align with African traditional medicine. I think it's a convenient thought that we don't have um, systems because it, if, if, if everybody acknowledges that there are systems in African traditional medicine in common with all other traditional uh, philosophies and traditional cultures, it will then force the powers that be that we must build and support the institutionalization of African traditional medicine, starting with the practitioner, rather than focusing almost exclusively on trying to find herbal drugs that will become a pharmaceutical equivalence. And when it's easy as well, and, and given all of our histories of colonization, including in our academia, which has taken a very, very Western slant and a very, very, um, uh, uh, anti-Indigenous uh, uh, knowledge and Indigenous sciences view of the world, it then means that we as healers and everybody else who walks with Indigenous knowledge have got to find language which then translates itself into the prevailing uh, paradigm, which is a very Western-focused lens. And it's interesting because when you now look at where medicine is going, which is starting to understand and starting to react to individuals, that is starting to now converge with what we have always known. Two patients can present with what would be called um, in my language, which I'm gonna loosely translate as flu-like symptoms. But their treatments when they walk out of my practice will be totally different because as well as the, the physical manifestation, this physical manifestation of this sense of illness, dis-ease, is not only just happening in a vacuum. There is a person who has a context to them. They're coming from a particular community. These two don't come from the same environments. They don't come from the same homes. They don't have the same um, 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 infrastructure and support, which would mean that you give them a one-size-fits-all. We're not a dressmaker's pattern as, as humans and individuals either is that it's that individual that you're looking at and that you treat as a healer and not just a standard formula that you just apply across. That also uh, goes with our philosophy that um, healing is not external of you, but you are part and parcel of that healing. And uh, what would be in, in Western parlance, 
the placebo effect, we understand that totally. And that is why most of our remedies would be given with the requirement that you, the patient, have to also be involved, have to also participate in the actions and the plans that stimulate and support your healing. And those are not things that are easily documentable in the current Western framework. And for me, what we all need to start thinking about is when academia science is ready to understand us in our paradigm, it means that you are also able to accept that you can't discount what our beliefs are and how we present healing um, to you. But you need to start being able to look at it holistically the way that we do and then interpret it into your language rather than the current requirement, which I find is about how do we as healers uh, speak in a language that is foreign to us. What that does, and it's an unfortunate thing which you can see throughout our practices across the continent, is that the younger generation is starting to lose even our disease names and concepts. You find people calling diseases um, or, 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 or states of, of, of Ill, illness in the same way as a medically trained doctor would be, which is allopathic medicine. And yet we have our own lexicons, we have our own descriptors, we have our own uh, 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 compendiums of health. And because of the infusion or the need to assimilate rather than a, 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 an environment which allows us to be ourselves and practice our art and craft and science, as the prof says, in the context within which it presents itself. And for me, if we were to start even working better with this, this idea of a calling, health is not a, um, a, 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 a you, if you are a healer, whatever health context you are, it's something that is within you. And so the way that you are able to treat and relate to people is very different as someone who's doing it as a profession, as a way that they are making an income because it goes beyond that. And that is the status that you find with us as healers is that it's not about how much a person can pay for the treatment. It's about the treatment and the healing of the patient, the patient's family and the environment. And that is where success lies for healing. But I didn't want to go too much into um, all of the philosophies because I think that's a whole conversation for a whole nother day. And I don't know if I'll be able to do it justice. But suffice to say that um, Prof. Uh, Imeje, I, I appreciate what they are doing and also understanding that it's capacity building that must go both ways. You can't just come and ask us our knowledge. What are you giving back? Because there isn't a healer on the planet who wouldn't want to improve their practice, who wouldn't want to be able to present it better because our goal at the end of the day is to the healing and health of our people. For me, what, I, what, what, what is of concern to me at this particular junction um, as an older healer is that um, the climate and environmental degradation has a direct and is a direct threat and a risk to our practice. Our medicines are still uh, wild harvested in the main. It's not even adequately documented. And so when you're hearing about extinctions that are happening, uh, even our plants, even our healing uh, arsenals are also being devastated at the same time. And, and, and all of this, um, while sustainability and climate scientists, they keep sounding a warning bell about the impact of humans on the planet and the resultant increase in greenhouse gases. Um, so this is not really a sustainability talk. So I won't even go into all of the science behind that because for me, that is not um, uh, the important part, but it's just an awareness that needs to come into us as healers and the supporters of the institutionalization of our practices and the longevity of them is that what is our role and our responsibility and accountability when it comes to the planet and the environment and the environmental uh, deg degradation. Traditional medicine is very much a practice which extends and integrates 
humans back into the natural world of which we are inherent part. Medicinal plants, after all, are plants which happen to be used in a healing and a health context by traditional practitioners to facilitate that healing in whatever form that this healing uh, needs to be. And so uh, healing is not confined only to the administration of the medicines in the way that would be done in an allopathic fashion. But traditional healing really is about reconnecting to the life forces and energy forces that are available in nature within us as parts and parcel of that nature. Again, I'm not saying that healing powers of medicinal plants and herbs cannot be used outside of their traditional context in a more reductionist fashion, because that would say, mean to say that they only work because of belief. That's not true. We all know that I could give you a medicinal plant now that can kill you. And so the power of plants is undisputed. And I think I read a stat that says that 50% of allopathic drugs are derived from plants. But it begs the question of how much more is there in nature for health and healing, which is being lost as we speak due to the ongoing minute by minute ecosystem degrad degradation and the loss of biodiversity, coupled with the loss of this very traditional knowledge, which has the keys to unlocking the healing secrets of nature. Elderly, and well um, uh, uh, and, and knowledgeable healers and ordinary members of the community because in the past healing wasn't a preserve of individuals, but it's, a com it's communal knowledge. And yet uh, the delays in getting to a point where we are adequately recording and documenting the healing practices without wanting to filter out already what it is, but just creating that library, that, that knowledge book, which is there, is dying out. And I, and I would hazard that as the plants themselves are getting extinct, the healers, of, 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 the healers themselves with the requisite knowledge in our languages, in our context, are also dying out because they're getting older. And the younger generation I mean, you, you can go on to uh, uh, what the young people call Dr. Google and find all kinds of things. And yet there's still this veil of mystery and secrecy around what would be an African approach to a particular ailment and particular healing. So initiation into traditional healing requires, it's a must that you must be exposed to natural phenomena like rivers, mountains, and oceans. And yet we are dealing with polluted rivers, drying up rivers, our oceans are dying and becoming deserts or becoming plastic oceans. And it seems our mountains, those still standing, are a lot more quieter than they used to be because of this loss of biodiversity. What are we saying as healers? What are we saying as, 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 as those who who profess to want to see this traditional medicine go from strength to strength um, about all of this. Because I, I, I had to do a little bit of reflection and, and think about myself if I couldn't harvest some of my medicinal plants. And, and uh, you know, ask the question, if I couldn't go to a river, when the dreams come, when nature speaks to me, because we speak still to nature, whether people want to believe it or not, all of a sudden, you read up about people talking about grounding, that you must walk, those are our practices. And yet, uh, we haven't been able to articulate them properly because no one is engaging with us in that way that we get to be able to start speaking about what it actually means to be a healthy functioning individual in a community uh, in the space of the world which is run in a way which is destroying everything that is a connection to us. So what does this all have to do with traditional healing? Absolutely everything. Humans are an extension of the earth, like every other living thing on this planet. Nature, made in its best form of healing for a natural being, including humans. Our adoption of reductionist practices for our own convenience does not take away from the fact that without exposure to nature and a natural environment, humans fail to thrive. Just think about um, all of us busy popping 
vitamin D, I won't say for what, because I may get into trouble. You go into the sun, the sun is there. And the chemical reaction between this natural being and that uh, 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 star creates that sunshine, that, that vitamin D that I need without having to pop anything. And yet we still want to stay with the paradigm that makes us, as we are insulated in our clothing, as if we are other than everything that makes this planet tick. The planet ticks for us as just as we tick for it. No sunlight leads to vitamin D deficiencies and depression. Lack of clean water leads to death. Whole natural foods as close to their natural state as possible is what nourishes our bodies. One of the, 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 the plastic scientists made the point that the reason plastics don't degrade is because they are man-made. If you are a thinker, it should make you ask your quest the question, what else is man-made that comes into our bodies that nature cannot deal with? And it's actually absolutely everything. Because for some reason, even as we develop things, we develop them outside of the structures and the way nature is. Nature recycles. We build a, an element or a, a compound that doesn't degrade. It's unnatural. That, you know, and, and we continue this, 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 this role or this vibe that says that we can superimpose ourselves onto the way that uh, nature is. I smile because um, um, at some point, maybe we will wisen up and realize that we are the expendable uh, part of this whole ecosystem, which is life. Processed man-made foods have led to the absolute proliferation of diseases, which are termed lifestyle diseases when we should call it what it is, that we are busy ingesting poisons. Unfortunately, in trying to modernize, we have set it up that the old ways are obsolete. They are old fashioned. And we all want to be at the height of the, of the material world of the consumption. And yet everything tells us that the old ways the simple ways, the natural ways are the ones that will sustain us and sustain life on the planet. Um, so okay. I'm you out can, of time. Yeah, we can okay. just wind up. Yeah. Okay. So for me, we do need to get more involved as healers in the debate about what is happening to the base of our healing arsenals. And if you just take two plants, that are almost extinct in the wild, and yet they are so powerful as uh, what, what, what in, in, in allopathic medicine would be called antivirals. What we call unugane, and I think he, Prof will give the English name one. There's none of it in the wild. And yet that medicine is so powerful that if it were to be used properly, uh, I think that we would deal with a lot of, of, of these issues that we see now where you're getting virus resistance to um, antibiotics because that's how it works. However, it's getting extinct in the wild. You take Pelagonium sedoides, harvested and exported to make a Western herbal, and it's getting extinct on the continent. And so as real healers, for me, the call today is actually not to everybody else, but to speak to healers is that we have to be concerned about our environment. We have to be more in touch with our very roots and genesis of humanity. And we have to care about the dislocation of humans from nature. Thank you, Gabong. Of course, Gabong. Th th thank you very much. Um, yeah, your passion comes through. The good thing is that we we actually would like to publish proceedings out of this um, conference. So you know, um, that that paper that you have presented will be very good to to put in as well. Um, actually, two years ago, we already wrote a paper. We called it "Sounding a Warning" on. Um, climate change and medicinal plants. So I've shared it also in the chat box and people can look at that. 
because obviously as climate changes, like you rightly point out, the resources for traditional healers become less accessible to them. So in, it, it becomes a matter of access to medicines for people. But um, thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a short presentation. So this is now in this thematic area of um, medicines. So we're going to have a short presentation from uh, Ms. Ndu Mulaudzi, who's going to talk about what modern techniques can we use uh, to actually test these medicines. Then after that, we are going to go into a political and climate change theme where we're going to get two speakers um, and then uh, we will finish with a food and innovation theme where we will also get two speakers. Um, according to the program, we should end by uh, 14.30 South African time, but we, should, we will be able to end well before that and also allow people to ask questions. But um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box or if you have comments. So over to you, Nduro. We will need again, uh, uh, if you can, Webmaster to allow for sharing. Can you please allow us to share? Uh, and Nduro, over to you. Webmaster, please allow sharing. Uh, Okay, I will then allow from my side. Thank you very much, Ndo, for coming through and you can share. All right, um, thank you everyone. We can see that for... now, yes. All right. Thank you everyone for making time to attend um, this conference. Um, as uh, introduced by the chair, I am Raoul Ndubo and I will be presenting about modern techniques for Asian science. And then in this case, we'll be more focused on high performance thin um, layer chromatography. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, there it goes. So uh, medicinal plants have recently become uh, the topic of global importance, influencing uh, both the world and health international trade. Um, through trial and error, people managed to develop various healing methods, and uh, these remedies were then shared verbally from uh, gen one generation to another. And then traditional medicine is still by far the most preferred form of med medical care till date, with an estimated uh, population of 70% making use of those herbal products, and then uh, consulting approximately 200,000 traditional healers on a daily basis in combination with visiting formal clinics and hospitals. Um, the South African taxa is consists of almost three, 300,000 species of which an estimated 3,000 to 4,000 are used for medicinal purposes, like in the treatment of various ailments, including fevers, uh, stomach cramps, anxiety, and also sometimes they are used as tonics to enhance um, appetite. These plants also pay, play an important role in the community by providing a source of income by trading raw materials and their products in informal markets, as well as uh, trading them, uh, trading fully commercialized products in both local and international markets. However, only a small number of indigenous medicinal plants have been fully um, commercialized and are available as processed standardized dosage forms such as your capsules, your uh, tea, and also essential oils. As you can see in the slides, I've put it examples of the most common tea that we know, which is rapos, which is uh, a herbal plant. And then we also have capsules that were made out of skeletum totosium, which uh, deals with anxiety. And then we also have a picture of um, an essential oil from uh, Lipia Javanica. So in this case, only um, indigenous uh, medicinal plants that still has potential for commercializations are only sold in informal markets as raw products, uh, crude extracts, and other um, 
products such as uh, infusions. And even though these um, indigenous plants have shown potential for commercialization, only legal attention uh, has been made to them uh, in in terms of uh, product developers and pharmaceutical companies in South Africa. Um, in many cases, these medicinal plants sold in markets, both informal markets and international trade markets. Um, they are sold as raw materials or preparation. So these uh, plants are wild harvested and therefore Virus factors such as climate, soil type, and genetic traits can influence the chemical composition of the plants, and this may jeopardize the consistency as well as the efficacy of the raw plant material, reducing the chance of successful and sustainable commercialization in international market, making quality control a very crucial matter in our country. Although different cultural tribes have managed to develop various traditional practices when it comes to herbal plants, these procedures are shared verbally with no document documentation in place or with no standardized procedures or protocols. Which is why SAPRA then introduced guidelines with basic criteria of evaluating the quality, safety, and efficacy of these herbal plants and their products, which then leads to us guaranteeing that the quality measures were followed when using any uh, herbal plant product. So quality control and standardization of botanicals is associated with uh, numerous challenges and with the herbal drug industry still developing, uh, access to sophisticated uh, modern equipment that can help us to deal with quality protocols, such as uh, your high performance thing layer chromatography, your gas chromatography is often limited, which is why a cost effective technique such as high performance thin layer chromatography, which is mostly known uh, by most people as TLC can be used to assist with quality control. Now, high performance thin layer chromatography is a readily available semi-automated technique used for rapid screening of samples to identify herbal products. The technique is the, an advanced form of your TLC, which you commonly know. Just like any other chromatography, it makes use of a stationary phase, which in this case will be your silica gel plate, and a mobile phase, which will be your um, solvents of different polarities. This technique compared to a normal TLC, TLC, it offers high speed, better resolution and reproducibility due to small particle size and associated surface area. And then compared to other sophisticated chromatography technique, it has a low operating cost, minimum sample cleanup, rapid uh, with high sample throughout. It's flexible and most importantly, it is in this economy, it is quite cheaper to use. So the technique is consists of um, an automated sample applicator, automated developer, uh, an automated visualizer, a scanner to perform both quantitative and qualitative analysis. So as you can see on the slides, I have put it uh, down two plates that uh, were developed for common medicinal plants that uh, are used in South Africa. So we have Terminalia sericea, which uh, the common part that is used is the root. And then we have your rebus tea fermented, which we usually have a cup of tea of it uh, every morning. So uh, this, uh, uh, we have well, the top one is it's, it's, it's a indigenous, indigenous plant that has a potential for commercialization. And at the bottom one, which is repos tea, it is uh, fully commercialized. So what I have done here is to spot different um, uh, plants that were cultivated from different areas and then spotted them with um, major compounds 
standards that are commonly known or that uh, a lot of researchers have identified as major compounds. So as you can see, this uh, technique, uh, it doesn't require any um, sophisticated measures where you need to have someone to come and interpret your results and all that, especially for up upcoming producers, because uh, it only allows you to identify if you have the correct plant or if you have the, the, the required amount of the chemical compositions that you want in your plant regarding it, what uh, that plant is used to treat. So what you just have to do is to optimize a method, run the plate, and then you will be able to see the chemical profile of your plant as in a picture, and then you can be able to identify if you have a certain band there, which will be, um, for instance, at uh, uh, the plate number one, if you can see at RF 0 0.5, you have this blue band there. So if you want to identify if you have the correct terminalia cellulosa, then if you have your standard, then you just check if it's there. And then if all those compounds are there, then you know that your product um, is going to work. And uh, anyone can be able to, 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 to check uh, such things when it comes to quality control. So in closing, I'll just say, um, as we are using medicinal plants, or as we are going back to using medicinal plants more often, it is uh, quite necessary for us to follow up with um, quality control measures. And as you were, uh, the previous speaker said that a lot of things are being lost in terms of uh, one generation to another. As I am, my generation don't know a lot about medicinal plants. We just go read about them in, on uh, Google Schooler and all that. So if these things are documented and quality control measures are being uh, followed, then uh, there's much that we can learn from that and still continue to spread this with the upcoming generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dua. Very interesting. Um, so for this uh, uh, thematic area, we're just going to open up to a few questions. If there are any questions out there, um, you can either put them in the chat box or you can just un unmute and ask. Or I don't know, there might be questions also on Facebook because this is on Facebook. So webmaster can check. But I wanted to start with a question or, or rather a, an interesting quote that um, Professor Emeja said, which was, um, because you don't understand it does not mean uh, that it doesn't work. It's rather a deficiency on your part. Uh, because I think there's always this assumption that, well, we have to be able to explain every phenomenon. And I thought that was quite powerful. But I wanted to ask uh, um, uh, uh, Makosi Amanda uh, around how do you think realistically traditional healers can um, collaborate or work together? I think that was the word that was used rather than integrate. How can they work together with con conventional healthcare providers? So thanks, Prof, for the question. And um, I, I mean, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, when you're looking at two, this question of equal or equitable comes into, into play, is that one is quite a well-established uh, system. And so it will be, so for me, one of the things that needs to happen before you can get effective collaboration is, is for us as healers to start documenting our practices. Okay. So I have a practice and 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 I'm and and yet I'm also quite guilty of not documenting because it's not something <laughs> that's you shouldn't have, that sits yeah. in my head, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a vexing question even for me is that how do I start in my small way, creating this evidence even if it's only observational I think is what you would call it because those are the building blocks and so for me we need to find a way of putting in the building blocks which get us to a particular level where I can have a conversation with an interpreter if necessary, with a Western medical practitioner, uh, allopathic, not Western, allopathic practitioner, and, and be able to then uh, treat patients together. I must say already, we do a lot of work with psychologists, 
uh, in particular, yeah. Prof. Um, because there is a, a, I think it's an under the table cross referral happening, but it's happening. Because mm -hmm. when a person goes to a psychologist, you can't strip off their culture and their context. You, mm -hmm. They come as they are. And so mm -hmm. you start seeing where that integration happens because you get a psychologist who call you and say, can you see someone uh, because this person, uh, I've reached the limit, but I think that there's something else that, that needs a, you know, a, a, a yeah. different approach which you have. So, but okay. even there, if we can start a basic documenting protocol for us in mm -hmm. our practices, which allows us to be able to then start answering some of the questions because it's not that the answers aren't there, but we've really been instinctive in a lot of ways. And I think that opens up the avenue for collaboration. Okay, yeah, so, so I think it's important then to, to document, or, uh, you know, these are interesting case studies, and I think it's definitely worth, um, you know, investing time in putting this together. Uh, and then, of course, technology, you know, um, uh, I have what a technological comment. tools. Uh, yes, go ahead. I, I have a comment that yeah. talk was so technical and presentable in a nice way so that everybody can understand it. So thanks to the speaker. Okay, yeah, Th thank, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, um, and I guess the use of technology, you know, um, how, what sort of apps or tools can we make, which will make it easier for, for healers to just do history taking. Um, I don't know if there's any other question, but uh, yeah, apparently, you know, um, and I think this is important because there are people in India watching right now. Um, so it would be good to see what they do in India. You know, there are people in the US also also watching. Um, uh, any question for uh, for Makosi? Uh, and then I have a question for Nduvo. So how many plants have you so far uh, documented or, you know, uh, analyzed in this way? Uh so far, I have analyzed, uh, I'll say, close to 40. 40, okay. And is this information in the public domain? Is it being used yeah. by regulators or by healers? It is in the public domain. Um, there are articles which are published with this, and also um, a book that has uh, this technique as part of it. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Because now we're going to go to the next thematic area. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for, for this one. Very interesting. Ancient science and ancient medicines. Now let's talk um, about politics and also the issues around climate change. And I'd like to call now to um, the podium uh, uh, Professor Sol Shava. Uh, Professor Sol Shava is at University of South Africa, um, and he's going to talk about uh, leadership and what is it that we can learn from ancient traditions, ancient African traditions about becoming better leaders and building hopefully better countries. So over to you, Prof. Uh, Professor Shava, if you're there, you'll need to unmute. And then after Professor Shava, we will have uh, Dr. Chakawia. All right, good day, colleagues. Uh, I hope my screen is visible, eh? Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Katerere. I am going to speak around uh, traditional leadership and its relevance for building democratic states in Africa. Uh, my particular focus will be on the Southern African context. And my presentation is going to cover the following aspects. Traditional leadership in, the, in a community context, uh, traditional leadership democracy and sustainability, and examples of uh, the potential role that traditional leadership uh, can play towards uh, democracy. <clears throat> uh, 
I'll start off with traditional leadership in a Southern African community context. I think the first thing that we need to uh, take cognizance of is the fact that there is controversy with regards to uh, colonial definitions of traditional leadership. Uh, I think uh, if you look at traditional leadership in Southern Africa, everybody is, who is a leader is uh, sort of uh, defined as a chief. And uh, yet in the traditional uh, perspective, that person might be a king. Uh, and yet we we have this connotation that seems to be common, commonly utilized whereby everybody is actually defined. I think it's uh, in a way trying to uh, undermine the leadership role that these uh, traditional leaders actually have. Uh, going on from that, uh, in traditional leadership, uh, there is a, the, the term or the proverb in Kosi, in Kosi Ngavant, or Ishe, or what we call Mambo Van. Uh, those uh, proverbs are actually stating that for somebody to be a, a king or a chief, it is because of the people uh, that are under him who actually make him that particular ship. And what also needs to be recognized is that behind the ceremonial role of a king or a chief selected along the royal line right, is a democratic practice based on a consultative process with uh, the community elders where the chief or the king actually uh, leads. And this brings to the fore the relational foundations of traditional leadership that are embedded in the role of the leader serving the people. So we're talking about seven leadership when it comes to traditional leadership there. And this uh, tenet is also supported in uh, through wound or wound, whereby we're talking about humanity uh, under the proverb uh, which means a person or an individual is defined by the people that uh, uh, they, they actually have around them. In Shona they say which means a person uh, is who he is be, be, uh, because of the community to which he or she belongs to. The primary role of a king or a chief is to be a mouthpiece for delivering fair and just a uh, judgments or decisions to the people under his rule. And um, this also, this role can also be played by a queen or a chiefess in the absence of the king or the chief. Regardless of the status of the perpetrator, the, the person who is accused and the complainant, uh, the main uh, emphasis there is that the wronged or aggrieved is fairly compensated in line with the rules uh, that are set by the community uh, leaders in the, in the area. So the chief uh, or, the, or the king's laws are based on accepted social norms, values and practices of the community under his leadership or her leadership. Most of the laws uh, serve the role of promoting social cohesion preventing unfair treatment, especially for the vulnerable members of the community. For example, the children, the disabled, the poor, the women and the elderly. It also uh, is there, the laws are also there to serve, uh, to protect the lived environment. That is the social e ecological landscape in which the people are dependent on for their livelihood sustenance. The latter being built upon uh, indigenous people's relationship with their ancestral land and the realization that they are a component of the lived environment which provides their livelihood. Most of these traditional laws that we are I'm making reference to are in line with the, the current sustainable development goals under the UN Agenda 2030 for Sustainability, which is a global action plan for people, the planet, and prosperity. The overall aim of Agenda 2030 is a through, the, through achieving sustainable development goals to eradicate all forms of poverty, realize human rights, and achieve gender equality 
as well as protect the environment, thereby balancing the three dimensions of sustainable development, namely ecological, social, and environmental. I'm going to draw on those uh, sustainable development goals in uh, trying to elicit how a traditional leader can actually contribute to a democracy. First, let's look at uh, the first goal, no poverty. Within a, a traditional leadership context, it is important for the leaders to promote a localized indigenous life or sustainable practices that enable uh, those uh, people in the community to actually survive. For example, uh, activities such as carving, pottery, metal, metallurgy, and weaving being examples of uh, localized practices that can actually be promoted by the traditional leaders. It's also important that they sustain uh, indigenous communities of practice that support the vulnerable members of the community. We have already alluded to that. For example, we have a communal a communities of practice uh, uh, such as in Nimbe, in Shona or Ilima, in Devele, in Zulu or Litsima, in Sutu, and so on, in which the community members jointly cultivate each other's fields. They don't just cultivate, they also go and uh, even uh, plow and they also harvest, helping the harvest. It's a rotational system whereby each and every household within uh, the community actually is helped by the entire community to uh, plow, to harvest uh, their, their fields in this case. That kind of practice actually enables uh, every member of the community to actually have something to uh, at the end to, to be able to harvest. Because even those that are, uh, have uh, uh, disabilities or those that are widowed and uh, would not have the capacity are enabled by this communal capacity that is actually there. If we look at the second uh, sustainable development goals, uh, zero hunger, traditional leadership uh, should play an important role in sustaining uh, indigenous sustainable agricultural practices that ensure food security and so sovereignty. For example, uh, the practice of multi-cropping, in integrated or mixed farming, whereby we there is a mixture of a, a multiple number of crops as well as a animal husbandry, the uh, growing of drought resistant crops and resistant indigenous breeds uh, of, of livestock, and such practices as indigenous composting and manuring, which are now uh, coming through in, uh, in modern sustainable agricultural practices such as permaculture. Uh, as being activities that try to reduce or to minimize dependence on uh, uh, man-made uh, fertilizers or non-organic fertilizers. There is also a, a practice within a local community in Southern Africa, which is called Zundera Mambo in Shona, or is part of the same course in uh, Zulu or in Nevele, where community members actually contribute uh, their harvest to the chief or the king's uh, granary, which is then used to feed the poor and the vulnerable, as well as to feed the community during times of drought and famine. The, the, this same granary of the king or chief also serves as a seed bank for traditional food plants, which can be grown in the future. So by having these practices, they, you are able to minimize a, a hunger within the common local community that is there. Good health and well-being, uh, I think that has been uh, already addressed in the previous uh, session that we had. The need to promote indigenous uh, health or medicinal practices. Uh, for example, during the uh, COVID-19 era, what resurfaced or emerged was uh, such traditional practices as steaming, uh, utilizing herbs uh, to, to, to minimize uh, chest uh, problems or, or chest infections that actually came through uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic there. A similar uh, aspect was uh, also evident during the time when HIV and AIDS was uh, prevalent 
where plants rich in anti antioxidants and nutrients and nutrients such as indigenous leafy vegetables, indigenous fruits and grains were actually promoted. So the promote for, for traditional leaders promoting this kind of uh, practices actually ensures good health and uh, well-being within the community that they are actually serve, serving. With regards to quality education, I think it's important uh, for, for traditional leaders to promote contextually relevant, in, in, relevant indigenous epistemologies and pedagogies, teachings and instructional methods, which can be included into the formal education curriculum, as well as uh, as an approach towards uh, decolonizing and Africanizing the curriculum itself. So with regards to gender equality, there are so many uh, activities that traditional uh, leaders can actually promote. For example, promoting uh, indig indigenous gender and non-gendered roles. For example, the traditional roles of the parents and the extended family and community. We always say from the African context, it takes a village to raise a child. In the past, uh, everybody within the community would play a role towards uh, the upbringing of a child, uh, the way they were taught uh, the, the required characters, uh, norms and values that they were supposed to, uh, to, to, to actually uh, have as children in this case and when they grew up. The role of traditional women as spiritual and community leaders and also needs to be uh, promoted. For example, we have uh, people like Queen Mujaji in Limpopo, who is, who is the reign queen. We have Mbuyane Handa in Zimbabwe, who was uh, quite uh, prominent when it came to the liberation struggle. The role that traditional leader, uh, traditional healers, uh, such as Sangomas and Izzy Nyan, we, we, we would be, in this case, both men and women actually play is quite important. They, the role of women in specialized trades, such as uh, basket weaving, pottery, beading, should also be promoted in this case to ensure that they, uh, prom they, they are able to provide for their families for livelihood sustenance. Uh, whether or not to maintain a control, uh, the controversial virginity test testing and the red dances that are uh, uh, quite prominent in Southern Africa is something that also needs to be debated since these uh, practices actually provide promote the value of uh, the chastity of women prior to marriage. With regards to clean water and sanitation, it is important that uh, traditional leaders uphold traditional water governance structures, the traditional water laws, such as uh, in this case, how uh, to, to, to protect uh, the water bodies that people rely on, such as wells, such as uh, wetlands, the rules and regulations that are around that. Like, for example, uh, people utilizing a well are not uh, allowed to, are not allowed to, 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 uh, to bring into the well posts that have soot on them or metal posts because what happens is particulate matter goes into the water and that uh, encourages, that promotes uh, evaporation and could cause drying of the well. So such practices like you cannot wash near a well, you cannot uh, ablute near a well, those kind of uh, traditional practices need, need to be sustained, especially around uh, traditional water sources. And there is also need to promote uh, traditional uh, practices of water purification, such as the utilization of wood ash, uh, the digging and protection of water wells and so, uh, as communal water sources. The traditional promoting the traditional practice of hand washing before meals and after funeral processions became uh, quite prominent with the COVID-19 pandemic, where people uh, were now uh, being uh, asked to sanitize whenever they went into public places. But this is a traditional practice that has been there and it needs to be upheld and promoted. With regards to energy, promoting indigenous sustainable clean energy sources, for example, innovative technologies that utilize and recycle organic waste, such as biogas energy, a traditional fire bricks that can be made from uh, straw animal and, and animal dung, 
could be practices that can be promoted by traditional leadership in this case within rural context. With regards to decent work and economic growth, uh, promoting indigenous uh, entrepreneurship, uh, particularly indigenous integrated farming, traditional craft making, is something that uh, traditional leaders can actually play a, a pivotal role in. Recently, there are Facebook pages where, where people have been selling their traditional farm products from chickens to nesting bugs, baskets of eggs to leather products, indigenous dog breeds such as greyhounds, and they also exchange indigenous seed varieties. So in that way, we promote, we promote the traditional uh, lifestyles and uh, livelihood sustenance uh, mechanisms. With regards to industry and innovation, industry innovation and infrastructure, promoting indigenous sustainable manufacturing, uh, indigenous structures and architecture, for example, uh, Basutu cultural villages in at the Golden Gate National Park in South Africa, where indigenous architecture sits alongside modern buildings. We are also seeing a lot of indigenous architecture coming through, like for example, when people build uh, gazebos or when they, they uh, build game ranches that have thatched, thatched the roofs on them. That is uh, emerging or emanating from traditional practices of thatching and the kind of uh, structures which are cool and even in, in the hot season and warm during the uh, winter season. So promoting such kind of uh, uh, practices is, is quite important. And also uh, indigenous uh, leaders, leaders can play an important role in reducing inequalities Advo by through advocating for indigenous people's rights, recognition and inclusion. Uh, there is an increase in the inclusion of indigenous people in their heritage across different environmental and social cultural sectors where none was there before. Issues such as indigenous uh, land re redistribution and also the indigenous communal practices that we have talked about, the communities of practice such as Ilima, Litsima, Nimbe, where people come together and help each other in, in, with shows uh, such as farming and other similar shows. With regards to sustainable cities and communities, uh, it is important for traditional leaders uh, to sustain indigenous communities of practice uh, for sustainability, such as Litsima, which we Nimbe and uh, Ilema, which we've talked about, and sustaining indigenous ceremonial gatherings, such as uh, weddings, funerals, and other rituals, ceremonial rituals that people do. With regards to responsible consumption and production, it is important for indigenous uh, or traditional leaders to promote indigenous sustainable production and con consumption systems uh, that have been in existence such as the mixed farming practices that have been there, the, the communal uh, practices such as Litsima, uh, and now what is also emerging is uh, these uh, money saving uh, practices such as stock fails in this case that uh, have emerged within communities. Promoting such practices uh, will enable us to, to actually uh, promote responsible consumption and production. With regards to climate action, sustaining and produce, promoting indigenous climate awareness, adaptation and disaster risk reduction. For example, uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic alongside climate change has uh, created different responses by indigenous communities, including the revival or research, suscitation of traditional practices and exploration of alternative livelihoods the sustenance uh, activities. Such uh, practices as uh, indigenous uh, practices of identifying seasonal changes uh, and being able to utilize uh, that knowledge uh, for weather prediction in terms of what to grow, when to grow uh, is quite important as climate action activities that need to be promoted. With regards to life below water, sustaining indigenous conservation practices for aquatic biodiversity is quite important. Uh, and with regards to life on land, sustaining indigenous conservation methods for terrestrial biodiversity, such as the traditional conservation of vegetation and wildlife, the traditional conservation of medicinal plants, 
the conservation of indigenous crop varieties and livestock grains is quite important uh, because it's promoting biodiversity and also agrobiodiversity in that uh, particular area. With regards to peace, uh, just uh, strong institutions, so maintaining indigenous uh, governance and peace, peace building practices is quite important uh, amongst uh, traditional leaders. Uh, dwelling on the Ubuntu or Ubuntu philosophy uh, within local community context. And then partnerships, we have already discussed the indigenous sustainability networks and partnerships for example, the traditional communities of practices such as Ilimali, Sima, and Ninde, and also upcoming uh, practices such as stock fails, uh, seed, and uh, livestock exchanges for food security and sovereignty are some of the activities. So these are some of the ways in which uh, traditional uh, leadership uh, can actually play a role towards uh, democracy while also contributing towards a sustainable development at the same place. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Shava. It's it's an interesting take, which I had not thought about, but actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back um, after the next speaker for, for questions or comments, uh, but you can put them in the chat box. So uh, our next speaker then is uh, Dr. Rumbitai Chakawia. And she's going to give us a short um, case study. I think one of the things we talked about, or Prof, you referred to as the issue around climate change, which is right now uh, that, you know, the only game in town. <laughs> if you are in sweltering Europe, you probably start to believe that such a thing exists. But it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, and people in the past have gone through climate variability and climate change. How have they coped? So over to you, Dr. Chakawia. You can share your presentation if you have one. OK, uh, we can see it. Just put it on. Um, a uh, full slideshow. Thank you. Over Is it to you. fine now, Prof? Yes, it's good. We can see burning forests and uh, <laughs> Thank people you. swimming at Eiffel <laughs> Tower. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I would like to greet everyone here. Uh, my presentation is on indigenous knowledge systems promoting a climate change adaptation and resilience in African communities with particular focus on Chiredzi rural district council where I did my study. So climate change is a global challenge. We are all aware of that and I'm sure we are noticing the associated economic, environmental, and social challenges coming with it. Uh, these pictures just show what is currently happening. We have seen what's happening in Europe, uh, fires raging, various places of Europe, temperatures rising. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Africa is not spared also from the burdens of climate change. Uh, we, we, are, we are witnessing warming temperatures rising, very cold winters, particularly this year, 22, 2022 has been very, very cold. So change is happening, but the question is, are we prepared, are our governments prepared uh, on how to deal with what is happening. Chiret's rural district is one of the African districts which is also exposed to climate change. These are some of the effects which are being experienced already in the district. Uh, deaths of livestock, pests are a problem in the district. Heat waves, continuous droughts 
unreliable rainfall patterns, weeds, food insecurity, floods every now and then, crop diseases, and a range of effects are being noticed <clears throat> in, the, in the district. However, the governments are trying their best to assist local communities, especially subsistence farmers or rural farmers to adapt to climate change. And this is happening through food aid, providing them with cropping inputs, uh, local extension workers, irrigation schemes, but it's not enough. So our farmers continue to be exposed to climate threats. But on the other hand, the farmers are not docile, but they are undertaking various autonomous adaptation strategies based in, uh, on their indigenous knowledge. Uh, this is knowledge they have been using since time immemorial, uh, and it forms their local decision making. It's centered in their beliefs, their local practices, and their culture. <clears throat> so some of the characteristics of indigenous knowledge in the district, it's local uh, knowledge uh, from the local community. It's also accumulated through experiences. It's influenced by the culture, the, the area of study is a Shangani, a, a Shangani culture, cultural context. It's unique. A indigenous knowledge is also generational. It's passed from one generation to the next. A, and it's passed orally. This picture is just trying to show how it has been done in the past, how our elders we're passing knowledge to the to 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 the younger generations. <clears throat> so these are some of the adaptive strategies, indigenous based strategies, uh, which I documented during my study in the in the local community, which are still being used. Uh, they use bed indicators to forecast the coming of uh, the upcoming seasons. And if it's a good rain for season coming, uh, birds like the great spotted cuckoo cries with a distinct sound in September and October, and they know they are going to receive rains. Uh, the one bill, if it has a distinct early morning cry, they know rains are coming. Birds, they show them they, that good rains are coming, especially if they fly around in abundance and when they are dark clouds. Uh, they also use trees, uh, for example, uh, average fruiting of trees indicates a good rain for season is coming, but <clears throat> if it's a lot of fruits, heavy fruiting and too much flowering predicts a poor rain for season, which means they have to prepare their stocks, whatever they have, they have to plan properly for the upcoming season. They also use insects like spiders. If they are running all over, it shows rains are imminent. Ants, if they are moving very fast in large numbers, collecting food, it shows rains are coming. So they have to prepare crickets singing continuously in September and October shows a good rain for season is coming. Dragonflies, uh, if they are in abundance, flying in abundance, it's a good rain for season coming. Caterpillars in abundance, it's a poor rain for season. Then uh, in terms of climate induced crop pests uh, in, in field and in storage, what they use to manage them in Chiredzi district, they are facing a lot of pests in their fields, especially armyworm is a problem. So they use ashes, they use river sand, smear it on the meristem of maize crops to remove armyworm. They use zumbani, they use trees like mutohoti, they use cow dung, they use chaff to treat weevils because the challenge is their grain is now even affected while it's still in the field with, with weevils. So they have to try their indigenous strategies. And as much as they are conventional, 
means they are using also, but most of them, they can't afford. So whenever they face challenges, they go back to, to what they know. And they also have a, an interesting practice they do in the, in the community, they call it Operation Keleke, they call it Kelekele, where they clean up pests, especially the armored ground cricket. It's a challenge in the district and they can't afford the pest sites. So they, they have a, 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 set, a specific day, they, pay, they, they set where farmers, everyone in the community, they go in their fields, they pick up the pests, tie them in plastic bags, they go to a flowing river and they throw them away or they burn them. Then in terms of livestock deaths and diseases, they also rely on natural resources to treat their livestock. They use things like Sumbani, they use Mwenga Wonye, which is shown on the picture with one of the knowledge holders who was part of the study. They use Gawakawa for respiratory diseases and also because of the droughts which are happening consistently, they are no longer keeping large heads of cattle as they used to do in the past. Like you'd find one household is with more than 200 cows, but now they just keep manageable ones so that when, they, when there's drought, they can be able to take care of them. <clears throat> in terms of unreliable rainfall patterns, droughts, long dry spells, they no longer practice a dry planting as they used to do in the past because sometimes when the rain comes, it's very minimal. So the seeds rot. So now they wait for the rains to fall and they start to, to, to put their seeds in the ground. They also optimize use of drought tolerant crops like sorghum, millet, rapoco, eh, not, and just minimal maize crops because of the of the temperatures in the district. And as much as people prefer maize, but because of the climate, which is changing, they are realizing it's better to go back to what they used to do in the past. Uh, also conservation agriculture is being practiced, multiple cropping, intercropping, and rainfall harvesting. They also use taboos, Ojiera in their communities, despite colonialism and Western epistemologies influencing how they conduct themselves, but they continue to cherish their indigenous values. And they use those, these to enforce desirable conduct of human behavior, to instill social rules, and even control human behavior in the environment. For example, <clears throat> Uh, it's a crime to cut uh, fruit trees. It's not allowed in the, 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 the <clears throat> they say, if you use a fruit tree firewood, it will chop the family. So those are some of the, the taboos they use and you can't cut down a mwacha tree, otherwise it will not rain in the community. So they use this for environmental management. However, there are challenges. Uh, uh, which are in terms of indigenous knowledge systems, it remains least documented. It's not only for the district, but in many places, in as much as a lot of noise is happening now on documenting indigenous knowledge systems, but it's still least documented and mobilized for sustainable development, especially with the governments. Inclusion of indigenous knowledge systems in decision making remains slow, and indigenous knowledge also is being lost, especially through the deaths of knowledge holders uh, before it's passed on. I'm sure one of the speakers indicated that uh, documentation remains a challenge, and also climate change is affecting some of the uh, natural resources they are using, especially trees for medicine for for medical purposes and all that. Uh, and also conventional technologies are sidelining indigenous knowledge and cultural beliefs 
uh, <clears throat> not forgetting religion. Most of the people in the district are no longer are moving away from some of the cultural beliefs because of religious practices. So in conclusion, climate change is a reality, is threatening humanity and the environment. Uh, <clears throat> but however, we can't run away from the fact that it's very critical, which has been helping local communities to respond to climate change impacts. Uh, and we also can't negate the role of conventional technologies. So it's critical for the two knowledge systems uh, to be integrated so that uh, we resilience and uh, adaptive capacity is enhanced. Uh, and this can be done through promoting ethical and equitable use of indigenous knowledge, uh, involvement of traditional leadership and consultation as well as inclusion of local community members in designing climate solutions. Thank you, Prof. And thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting window into how communities are adapting. Um, and it's important that you've documented it. So now we're going to have a few questions for this session. Uh, you can just unmute and ask questions, colleagues. Uh, that is fine. So you can ask questions to Professor uh, Shava and also questions to Dr. Rumbi. Maybe I will just start with you, Dr. Shava. Um, uh, do you think that we would be a less corrupt a continent or nation states if maybe uh, the chiefs were in charge rather than the politicians? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky one, but I think it, it, it all uh, dwells around uh, the role that the leader serves to the community. Is it a servant leadership or is it a, a selfish leadership? When you look at yeah. most of the traditional uh, leadership structures, you would find that they were largely based on servant leadership. And so I, I would believe that if we, 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 we focus on that, we would have less corruption as compared to mm, a, yeah. a different yeah. kind of leadership where mm. like yeah. we have yeah. important leadership that is there. Yeah. yeah. And also these chiefs uh, live in the community. You know, so yes, there's no yes. way that I am going to neglect building a road and send my money That's to right. Geneva when I live in that community. So I have uh, begun to strongly feel that way, that we actually need to invest more in um, local leadership structures, be they traditional or, you know, uh, even the modern local council structures than in yeah, people I who agree live with in, you in, in the big yeah. cities, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do, Dr. Charles, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Prof, and thank you, uh, Professor Shawa there, and also uh, Dr. Chakawia. I just tuned in. I asked my two questions uh, on, the, on the group, uh, sorry, on the chat. Um, Prof Shawa, you know what's happening in Zim? You were quoting quite a lot of uh, Zimbabwean examples there in terms of traditional leadership. Uh, there is this uh, Masabokus who are very partisan, who are mm -hmm. very partisan, and they are, you know, what is going on in terms of the uh, times uh, at the time of elections uh, when they are voting. Um, is that my question? Is is that an abuse of uh, traditional leadership? And if it is, what can be done to stop that uh, abuse? Um, if I can just ask my two questions, the next question is to, to Dr. Chakawia, in terms of uh, those predictions, you know, the, 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 the indicators that the traditional indicators for climate, whether it's going to be a good rainy season or, or, or there's going to be a drought, you talked about caterpillars and so forth, very interesting there. Um, my question is, have those um, indicators been validated? How accurate are they? Can we use them? Can we document and 
pass on that information to our communities so that they can actually use those predictors uh, to guide them uh, in terms of uh, uh, what to do uh, in their cropping. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Shava first. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I would say uh, to you, Doc, that when things get politicized, uh, it's no longer about saving the people. It's about saving uh, external interests, uh, which in, in, in this case, uh, it diverts from the primary role of, uh, of, of traditional leaders, which is to save the people, to, to, to actually work with the people. So when you are working with external uh, groups or external uh, political structures, I think uh, we have actually subverted the primary role that a uh, traditional leadership is actually supposed to have because it is now a very politicized uh, kind of system which is no longer serving the people. Yes, uh, next. Uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, in terms of validation of uh, the indicators of climate uh, of, uh, of the upcoming seasons, I would say uh, the local communities or the indigenous knowledge holders, according to them, they have tested these and they've experienced it over a long time. So for them, it works. For us, we might not understand it, but for them, it's working. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it has been validated by conventional scientists and their accuracy. They were also mentioning that because of the changing climate, some of these indicators they have been using, they are being affected because of what is happening, because of the changes which are happening. So I think there is need for more research on that to see what is really going on. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't know if uh, any other questions, colleagues. Uh, I also just wanted to highlight that actually there's a book uh, that we edited not so long ago. And some of these issues that are being um, discussed are actually in this book, including this issue, as you can see the, this, um, is kind of the royal seat. Uh, it's actually a headrest. So we also try to look at um, indigenous leadership uh, from a slightly different angle to the one that um, uh, Professor Shava has, has presented. And again, as I've said, that we are hoping that we can gather all this information into another book, which uh, at the end of this uh, workshop or seminar just now, um, Professor Rustagi will just briefly talk about the, you know, the objective of having this uh, uh, conference. And this is just but a panel of a much bigger conference that's going on right now. Um, so without further ado, we are now, I don't know if there are any further comments or questions on this particular panel, because we are now going to go into the next panel, which is a short one. Um, and this panel is really about innovation. So we talk about all these things, but um, what possible innovations can we uh, bring out from, uh, okay, I think it's this screen. I hope you can see this screen. So what possible innovations can we actually bring from our traditions? So the, this one is a recording. So let me go through to it. I'm a co-founder of Mutuko SA. Uh, sorry, let me just go to the beginning. Yeah. Good day, everyone. My name is um, Shea Bayade. I'm a co-founder of Mutuko SA. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about the lessons we've learned innovating with um, African foods. We all know that food plays um, an important role in um, 
the etiology, the prevention and the management treatment and treatment of many diseases. We eat food every day and um, for nutritional benefits. But in addition to this, there are some foods that um, give us therapeutic benefits. And these foods are known or classified as functional foods because they provide additional physiological advantage by preventing, managing, and treating different diseases. And the mechanism of this of the action of this um, functional foods depends on the macronutrients, the ma micronutrients, and the fine chemical components that are available within them. In the last few decades, um, we we've seen that there's an increasing interest in the health promoting potential of culturally salient food plants for the prevention of chronic diseases. And um, a lot of attention is now being paid to neglected foods or indigenous plants from different cultural communities in Africa. Either these foods are grown or they are gathered in the wild. And these foods, we know they are either prepared as staple foods or as traditional vegetable dishes or stews. So we, one of the things that we did a few years back is to conduct a review on the traditional indigenous knowledge of um, food plants used in the management of diabetes in West Africa. And in this re this review was published in, in the book um, Traditional and Indigenous Knowledge for, for the Modern Era, a natural and applied science pers perspective where um, Professor Kateri and I were part of the co-editors. We're able to document food plants eaten in West Africa that have the potential not only for nutrition, but also in the management and treatment of diabetes. In our review, we found out that over 157 West African food plant species from 141 gen, um, genera and uh, 58 families have been identified as plants with potential anti-diabetic properties. Of this 154 food plant species, we found out that 126 species from 50 families have been studied scientifically for their anti-diabetic and anti-diabetic um, properties. And um, common leafy vegetables such as Venonia amygdalina, simum gratissimum, maniot esculenta, telferia occidentalis, and cocoro solitarius have been validated for the uh, anti diabetic potential. This validation includes both in vitro and in vivo. Um, studies that have been carried out. We also found out that seeds <coughs> of Telferia occidentalis, Cocumeropsis mani, Pachia biglobosa, and Ivingia gabonensis, gabonensis have also been used in the management and treatment of type 2 diabetes. So after we conducted this review, we decided to look at um, indigenous um, grains that have been neglected and we decided to see if we could add value to it. So we picked several um, indigenous grains that were climate smart and one and um, such grains um, include um, sorghum and millet. So in adding value to sorghum, what we developed was um, nicello, which is a cereal drink that is um, sweet and sour with the added benefits of um, life bacteria culture. This um, drink was developed by scientists at Tony University of Technology. It's made of brown sodium and, and probiotics, pre and probiotics. It's gluten-free, it's lactose-free, it's high in protein and energy and it contains a high um, level of um, bacteria colony forming units. This um, drink is also high in antioxidants. 
The one of the things that was done during the formulation of um, this drink beverage with um, sorghum is that we selected phytonutrients that are functional and functional prebiotic oligosaccharides and then probiotic strains that would add health benefits to whoever drinks it. And one of the reasons why we embarked on this um, project was the fact that nutrition outcomes are very poor because of over-reliance on these people in South, Southern Africa. And then um, micro, we understand and we know that micronutrient deficiency leads to poor mental development and physical performance. It also leads to constipation and diarrhea and poor micronutrient absorption. So, what we so when we did a market survey, we tried to look for beverages that were already in the market to try to understand which of these beverages contain probiotics. And we found out that most of the beverages we found that had probiotics were dairy products and they were mainly in the up market, only for the up market um, population. And what another thing we also found out that was that they had their shelf life was short. So in in our research, one of the things that we tried to do was to see if the probiotics, different strains of um, lactobacillus, would grow on the sorghum grain. And we also tried to formulate the product in order to increase. The shelf life so that it would have the added advantage compared to all the other beverages that had probiotics in the market. And what we've been able to do is that we've been able to increase the shelf life to four months. We're able to grow the different lactobacillus strains on sorghum and also on millet. And um, we we were able to get and grants and funds to commercialize this product, this um, beverage across South Africa. So our startup, which is called Nutrigo SA, is a spin out from 20 University of Technology and um, we've been tasked to commercialize this product. And um, in the last few years, we've been able to grow from um, Victoria, to the Alten province, and we are looking into increasing our footprints in several other provinces across South Africa. And um, in this journey that we've um, embarked on in the last um, three, four years, we've learned quite a number of lessons that um, as um, scientists, um, we needed to increase our knowledge and needed to learn more about what business entails, what entrepreneurship entails, and uh, how to source for funding. So funding, I would say, is the biggest um, issue that um, we've had in the last few years. And I think that is the issue that um, every person who wants to innovate with African foods would have, because to add value to the everyday food crop or grain or, or or vegetables you need funding to be able to do a large scale commercial production and um not there are not um, a lot of funding bodies who are willing to fund um at i would say a, a large scale as in most of all the funding bodies that we've had to pitch, they were looking to fund in millions of dollars and were not willing to take um, the risk. Um, so funding has been to start on a small scale and to grow gradually was, um, was what we focused on, but we realized that would not work. That we want to go all out, we'll have to go all out. And um, this funding, apart from using it to increase production, we also require this funding for setting up the manufacturing plant. Because um, till date, we've been 
contract manufacturing and um, we realized that um, we, we do not have control over our stock because we, we, we don't have access, direct access or immediate access if we need to produce regularly and all that. So we need, so funding is a major issue and um, we need this funding to be able to set up our own manufacturing plants to be able to meet our current demand and also to increase our footprint because that's one of the things that um, as a startup that you need to do to be able to make profit, increasing our distribution network. And um, we are hoping that um, in the coming months and months and um, year, we will be able to increase our distribution network across all the provinces in South Africa. And this will be done by increasing our, uh, our, our access to digital and then traditional forms of uh, marketing, being able to maximize all these social media platforms, be able to market ourselves and to tell people about our products, and also to use the traditional form of marketing by going to all the retail um, shops and outlets and malls and trying to um, increase awareness to our product and um, so that we'll be able to increase our sales and our revenue and then we'll be able to um, make profit. But apart from making profit, one of the goals of um, producing this um, drink beverage is to be able to help reduce malnutrition across Africa. And so we are hoping that in the next few months and the next few years, we're able to increase access of um, the population of Africa to our drink so that um, we would play a part in reducing um, malnutrition across the continent. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. That was the presentation on a case study of uh, innovation of uh, traditional knowledge. Um, now we are going to get Dr. Togo, who is really the expert in innovation in this space, uh, talk to us. And that will be our actually our last formal presentation. Then we'll have a you know, a short discussion before we close. Over to you, Doc. Okay, thank, thank you, Prof, and greetings, everyone. I'm going to talk around the practical aspects on the commercialization of the indigenous based technologies based on the experience from business incubations that I, I've led. So, I, I think the previous speakers have captured quite a lot, and that can be summed up by the African proverb that can be loosely translated to say, only the soil can tell whether the mouse pup, mice puppies are ill. And by the same token, it's only the soil that can provide the medication. And when you look at our indigenous people and how intimate they are with the environment, as Dr. Amanda indicated, everything comes from the soil. So it's, we can say generally say that when you look at the survival mechanisms of our African indigenous people, there's a lot of innovation that is, that is going through there. And the main challenge that we normally encounter is how do we now expand or commercialize it beyond the communities themselves? Because with this globalization and reaching out to other communities, it is always good to exchange these products and get also what is being made from other indigenous knowledges outside the African system. So generally the 
in the products and technology environment that we find ourselves in our indigenous knowledge workers is that their products and technologies work. And there's always a tension between the issue of which knowledge is superior than the other. And in most cases, you would find that the, indigenous, the African indigenous knowledge is usually subordinated to the Western one, which is one of the issues that we found, a challenge that we found in trying to commercialize. Because when we try to commercialize, depending on how we articulate ourselves, we, we end up trying to, we end up sort of seeming to as if we are subordinating one knowledge system to the other, which does not work. And there's also the limited documentation has been talked about, but what I've learned from interacting with the knowledge holders is that sometimes the limited documentation is a way of intellectual protection. When you look at how the knowledge is transferred between generations and how the indigenous knowledge holders select the person to carry the clan knowledge with regards to specialization they look they there are certain pre there are certain qualif qualifying criteria that they use but the fact that we don't know how they use it sometimes we tend to think that indigenous knowledge holders are selfish so there's an issue of trust intellectual that, that 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 goes with intellectual protection and the issue of limited documentation even though it is good to document but sometimes <laughs> documentation may actually be inaccurate depending on who is being told because our elders know what to say when what not to say and just to reinforce what dr chakoya was saying if you look at that picture you can see those nests are pitched way up in the tree. In actual fact, that is one of the predictions that our elders use when we are having flooding. The beds, the, the weaver beds, we have there. Most of them we have their nests high up the tree. As you can see, that that's part of the African indigenous knowledge system. But also, what we what we picked up mainly in trying to commercialize some of these technologies that a couple of our scientists, they get shipped out overseas to get training in various techniques, which is good. But then when they come back, they will spend more time trying to adapt the techniques that they would have learned to try and work with the current or the samples that we would have. So they will, in so doing, sometimes there's, a, they, they, there's some loss in terms of the components that they will be working with in terms of plant extracts and, and so forth. And the other issue that we find is the issue of sustainable scaling, because if we are commercializing and by increasing the market, the question becomes, can, they, can we then have raw materials that would suit the market or that would satisfy the market? So these are some of the issues that we find in the products and technology environments of our indigenous products were during the journey to commercialization. And in so doing, we take into consideration a number of aspects, for example, the market standards. Most of it, yes, in our own communities, we know we can say, give them handful and mix it with a cup, but we don't measure in terms of meals and grams and all the like. But if we are to take the products out, that has to be done. And the security of supply I've talked about. And we sometimes in so in standardizing, you also try to characterize the components because the one knowledge system would require or the other market would require us to identify the components, not just a homogenate. And in so doing, when we isolate, sometimes a single component may not work in the same way as it would have done in the concussion. And the other challenge that we face in commercialization is the issue of benefit sharing, whereby we say, if we are going to take a plant from a certain community, or if we are going to use the knowledge from a certain community, when the person who is leading, it could be a scientist, with the Western trained scientist who can commercialize that and how are the communities going to benefit? 
And that's where some of our legislation cover, particularly in South Africa, the benefit sharing issues and all the like. But what is critical also is an aspect around the business strategies and models. I think Prof. Shara did indicate something around the leadership. And what we found in, 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 in assisting knowledge holders to go commercial was that what sometimes we would say competition, when we say our, to our entrepreneurs, when you compete, you need to outcompete your, your other competitors or, or, or other similar businesses in your environment. And the, there is always a challenge in that because some of the, in, in most cases, there is that communal understanding, the communal culture whereby the entrepreneur would, would not see competition as outdoing another person, but they would see it as growing together. So if you want to do a competitive, or you want to do a competitive strategy, it becomes something different, whereby one would need to adapt and see, understand the culture from which the individual is coming from, or from the, which the knowledge order is coming from, so that you don't you, you don't introduce competition as a foreign idea, but the one that would help them to do better because some will get fulfillment actually by seeing their business growing as well as their neighbor's business growing. And the other issue that we have seen that helps is the issue around the packaging and labeling. Most of our indigenous products, what sells is the story behind the product. So we would encourage our entrepreneurs and help them with the packaging and labeling. The same way around the optimum processing, I'll talk about it in the next slide when I look at the issues that the considerations that we, we or the aspects that we have implemented in the commercialization of the indigenous knowledge the products. So what we did, especially during the incubation, you look at that, or the indigenous knowledge world and where the product is coming from and look at the other or the general the generally acceptable standards within the markets that we want our products to go and there's always need to balance the two and you do not try not trying to show the knowledge orders where that we, that this knowledge is better than the other, but in, in, in fact, what we do is we interface the two. What we did was we ended, we, we, we designed a program where we have the traditional knowledge holders and our university scientists, we train them together. They share their stories so that each would understand where, where this group is coming from, where this group is coming from, and they grow and develop in trust. So when one, so that they could avail each, each one's products and methods to one another. And in so doing, we also picked up the issue around the rewarding in, 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 in where, we, where we say, what is it that motivates this entrepreneur? Is it the money or is it the, the helping of the community. If it is the helping of the community, but there's also a need to understand that the business operations, they are costly. Be it your sweat or the raw materials that you put into. How then do you cost and then it, how then do you convey the idea that when you are charging for a service, it's not that you want to enrich yourself, but you want to sustain the business. So it's one of the aspects that we've managed to do well and in, in commercializing of some of our indigenous knowledge technology, best technologies. And in particular in South Africa, what we also picked up is for one product to go on to the market, there is need for involvement of multiple stakeholders, especially across the different government departments. It's, uh, because what you'd find is in issues around fundraising, some would just fund the basic research, some would fund the equipment, and some would fund market access. But if there is no aggregator in the ecosystem that can bring all this for the, for the indigenous knowledge holders, it becomes a problem. 
The issue of the business models, I've talked about it and how we've adapted the strategies. But also one of the aspects that I found very critical around the products from the indigenous knowledge world is that useful as they are, sometimes they are in small quantities. And being in small quantities, most of the investment tools, the, the assessment tools that are used when they want to raise money from investors, they do not work. So there is a need to have, again, an aggregator or a common platform or a common ground where you have got one organization helping in clustering common technologies or technologies that would use common equipment so that instead of having 15 indigenous knowledge holders applying to get 15 pieces of equipment that do the same, but being utilized at 10% capacity, you would have one applicant who can provide the technical support until these indigenous knowledge holders grow at their end and then are able to make enough profit to buy their own. And there's also that aspect of the relevant legal protection where we have got the Department of Environmental Affairs, the Department of Science and Technology, where they look at benefit sharing agreements. If you take, if you have got a product from a certain community, what is it that the community is going to benefit from the sales? And that has also helped in the commercialization of those indigenous knowledge technologies. And just as a way, examples that to show you what I was talking about, we've got a cosmetic product, Poshia M Skin Solutions, that was from a mother-in-law to a daughter-in-law. So you can see the trust was between the mother-in-law, the daughter-in-law, and how it, it, it moved from there is because the mother-in-law saw the grandchild having a problem and then imparted the knowledge to the daughter-in-law for the benefit of the grandchild. And then that was scaled up. Now the community is benefiting. Then we have got the Makamisa food. It is an example from the father-in-law to the son-in-law. Then Global Health Biotech is an example from the traditional healer to the university researcher. And now we've got those products. So this is just from South Africa, but also other countries we have got, for example, the Devil's Claw. I do not have much information around the benefit sharing on these ones. The Devil's Claw, that is in Namibia, Botswana, but mainly Namibia, we have got also this Zumbani that is in Zimbabwe. So we have got a different example. So this, I just wanted to paint a picture around what considerations do we normally give and how have we managed to commercialize some of the indigenous knowledge-based technologies and how do we infuse that traditional knowledge with the scientists so that the products can reach markets besides their own in the communities that from which they are used. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tobo. So um, we would like to just take a few questions and then we will close um, for this uh, thematic area. So this was around uh, innovating with ancient science and knowledge. Do we have any questions or comments here? Uh, maybe just a question to you, Dr. Togo. Um, so, so what you're saying to me is that there's a kind of disconnect between the, the indigenous innovators and uh, the market on the one hand, but also the kind of support that governments uh, are providing. Is that it? Yes, there is a, a disconnect, especially on the type of support because you find that the type of support that is normally given, it requires somebody who has got an appreciation of the indigenous knowledge, maybe somebody who has undergone through a decolonized type of education or would appreciate that 
for one to mm -hmm. develop the tools that suit the support of the indigenous knowledge holders and also the issue around the market there, there is a, a need to understand what the market needs and why does it need it it is it, in, in, it must be looked from a perspective of not subordinating one knowledge system to the other but she explained in a way that the market to behave to to behave the market the market from different cultures or from different knowledge systems where we want mm -hmm. to take our product to requires to see a b c why do they require to see that so that it, once that is understood we can have we we can we can we, we can take in some of the standards or stipulations for products in mm -hmm. a lighter way as opposed to having a, one system trying to subordinate the other yeah but i mean of course standards are, are political i mean you uh people don't want to admit that but something like gmp is eu gmp or fda you know these standards are made to protect markets um, but, but there's also another observation, at least from when I work with, with uh, uh, indigenous innovators, is just the requirement by government or by sub, you know, whoever is potential investors that they should come up with a business plan, you know, which itself, on an, as you saw from the previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, even highly qualified scientists find it hard to put together a business plan. But now we are requiring a traditional healer to come up with a business plan. Uh, are there other ways maybe of going around these kind of things? Yeah, I think the, yeah, the issue of business plan does not only apply to the traditional healers. Unfortunately, it also impacts negatively on even the general startups, especially in the emerging economies, because some of the demands on the business plans are not are difficult to meet. So there is a need to have a, to, to have customized or adapt adapted investment tools that suit the developing environment, the developing economy environment. There are things that would need to be looked into, but I think that calls also for multiple stakeholder engagement where we look at those that teach investment according to which standards are they teaching the investment issues or consideration of the investment issues. Because most of the times what I've seen is that you just get some they just it's it's more of a copy and paste of MBA. The yeah, it's for yeah. MBA. It's for MBA it's graduates. It. Yeah, yeah. But and yeah. I'm glad, of course, that our collaboration here is with the uh, business school at Howard University. Uh, so thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions for Dr. Togo. Okay, because we are now going to close. So what I will do is I'm going to ask each of our speakers to just maybe. Uh, 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 you know, have uh, just parting words, just one, you know, uh, one minute uh, or shorter of um, uh, a, a, a take home message. And then I'm going to hand over to the organizers, uh, Professor Rastagi and the DV Welfare Society. So maybe let me start then with uh, Marcos. Uh, Dr. Amanda, just, you know, final words from this whole discussion and also maybe where do we ought, where do we ought to go in the, you know, in the future if we're going to have uh, similar things, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, and to the organizers as well. I think it was um, well organized and the different voices and the views uh, came together beautifully. For me, it's really about how do we support um, the, the, the document, everybody, the overarching theme, even all the conversations has been about documentation. And so I do think that um, there's, there's space there for the creation of a documentation tool or process that can be easily, you know, transportable and that we can all teach 
so that we start um, um, that, that process of empowering healers to be able to start owning their story about their product. Uh, Dr. Togo spoke just now about um, that, the, that the story behind the, the particular remedy sells, but if you don't have our story, then I don't know which story you're going Someone to Someone else would tell. <laughs> Ex exactly, you know, and, and I think that um, uh, occasions like this are, are useful because we start getting accustomed to the fact that Africa has a vibrant traditional medicine that stand alone. And so maybe the bigger the light is shone, then we can start asking each other the hard questions of so many years post-colonization, why have we not made the strides that we should? And I think that um, that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves, hard questions. I mean, even us as healers is, why aren't we seeing more young healers taking the scientific path so that the translation is being done by knowledge holders, you know, being the interpreters in these two worlds. And so with that, I really appreciate the opportunity um, and also, you know, for everyone who's listening in and hopefully, for me out of this, if we come up with one intervention, it's that common yeah. thing is that we all say documentation is a problem. It's so what, what are we gonna do about it? About yeah, it yeah. Okay, all right. Um, Duvo, in that thematic area of uh, medicine, uh, final remarks from you? You uh, can also no. just uh, show, show your video and then, yeah. So everybody's uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, from my side, I'll just say, uh, like what uh, Dr. Makuzi was saying, uh, we need to work together. Maybe in the next session, what we can do is uh, we have started with, okay, remedies this and that. Maybe in the next one, then the way forward, what should you do? Where from here? We have people, maybe also with Dr. Makuzi, she might have her own products. What does she do now to further with that so that they can be commercialized and all that yeah so that will actually help Thank okay you. um and then uh, uh for the next session uh, uh professor shava uh, um, thank you i think from my side uh, we need to recognize the fact that uh, traditional leadership is always there because the majority of people uh, within the African context are actually governed by traditional leadership. And it can play a very pivotal role in promoting indigenous knowledge uh, practices in actually bringing them to the fore as aspects that can actually lead us to a, a better economic uh, and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a grand uh, grandson of a chief myself, I'd like you maybe to help me to put me back in my clan at some point, <laughs> because I've just started to believe more and more that um, you know the the role of traditional leadership is probably key to to building better African societies. Yeah, yeah. So I will approach you offline <laughs> and come up with a campaign strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I think uh, Dr. Chakawe has left. So in the last session, the last thematic area, um, Zukuru uh, Togo. Okay, thank you. I think what what I would say is, is that we need to embrace everyone. And we need to call to promote dialogue so that we get more from the indigenous knowledge holders who are the solution, who have got more solutions. And maybe the, the question moving forward will be how do we include each other in, in our conversations such that we need we can demonstrate that affording to go to school does not mean one is intelligent. And mm -hmm. indigenous knowledge holders are also wiser. If, if, mm -hmm. if, if they are wise, if not more wise, if not wiser than those who have gone to take their products and characterize them and get PhDs and professorships, and then the rewarding system would then reward the professor who, who characterized what has been working, what has been used by the indigenous knowledge For holders. Generation. How do we bring them up and ensure that? they also feel included and we share those things and come up with the robust solutions that can actually help the globe. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, so respect for traditional knowledge, but also how can it assist in the current global challenges? Um, uh, Professor Rastahi, would you like to close the session? Is Narendra there or uh, maybe somebody from the DV Welfare Society? I see Professor Rastaki, but if you're there, uh, you can unmute and close. I, I think he's not online. Uh, okay, you can go ahead and close, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that was the best session and well organized. Uh, most of the talks were highly technical and then in a simple way, narrative. And so that everybody can understand it. So I thank you very much. And I thank all the speakers in this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, keep safe wherever you are. I thank you. Um, goodbye.